All right, well, it's good to see you guys. Appreciate you coming out tonight. Do a little bit of review and move forward a little bit. Try to paste this thing in a place that we can all hopefully remember some things. They, one of the discouraging things that I learned in Bible college years ago is they told us that 95% of what we preach is forgotten within three days. <laughs> And so that means you're only going to get 5%. So I've got to remember as a preacher, I'm trying, I'm trying to be intentional about what 5% you'll remember. That's why sometimes I do crazy antics and do stupid stuff, because I'm trying to scar your memories. You know, like the first week when I do the houses and mess them all up? That was really intentional. You know, that was just to see if you so would remember it. No. Uh, so we're going to start, like last week, I didn't even get to the PowerPoint presentation. And so we're going to start there. Anybody remember playing? Yes. What's your name? <laughs> Peter, Paul, Mary. <laughs> you remember, how many of you used to play the game Clue? You know, Mr. Green in the library with the wrench. Remember playing that? You know, well, really, when we start the book of Acts, what really we're starting with is, is not a game, but like Clue. Because in the first eight verses, what Luke records is he records Jesus presenting himself alive after he was crucified. He's proving, he's giving them evidence. We don't think of, when we think of faith, we don't think of evidence. We tend to think faith is a blind thing because we've been conditioned by a naturalistic mindset that's really taught in secular society that this world is all there is, that there's nothing behind it. And so, in, in what we, even as our worldview is shaped and how we look at the world, we tend to look at it from, as in America, as this is what you see is what you get, and that's promoted by a number of different philosophies and sciences today. And so we, we kind of think that this is all there is, but yet in our hearts we know there's more to it. But how that affects faith is people don't think of things of faith as having a basis in evidence or the real world. And that really isn't true. Because what Jesus does after he rose from the dead, he first of all was crucified, all his disciples, all his followers left him except for the women. And we all know that who's going to hang out there? Mom's going to hang with her son, and, and women are going to be faithful. And what do men do? Men are on a hide. You know, but that's that's just the way it goes. The women stayed, now I'm picking on the men, but 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 they stayed, and Jesus' followers dispersed. Peter denied him. Judas, as we'll see a little bit next week. Judas actually betrayed him. Jesus' followers shrank down to a few women, women and John the Apostle, because John was the guy that, that stuck, it, stuck it out. And Luke starts by recording that when Jesus, after he rose from the dead, he gave evidence to his disciples that he was alive. And today, what we're reading in the Gospels, one of the things we tend to think of when we read the Bible is that this is just one book, but actually this is 66 books. From an evidential standpoint... There are 66 documents. Anybody ever buy a house? Okay, anybody ever buy a car? Anybody ever do a will? What do you sign? Documents, right? Now you have all kinds. In fact, to buy a house now, it's like that many documents. It's incredible, right? It used to be a little handshake and thin piece of paper. Now it's that many. There are 66 documents here. Because they've been brought into one book, we tend to look at them. Oh, that's one, that's one book. And I'm going to throw it away. But if you, if you were to go to a court of law, you would, the judge and the jury would be presented with 66 documents testifying to the same thing. That's how strong the evidence in the Scriptures are. And when we read the New Testament, what we're really reading is the testimonial evidence of eyewitness accounts of what they saw, felt, and touched. And we need to start thinking that way when it comes to approaching the Bible because we have to overcome in our world this mindset that says science is real and faith is unreal because that's what we really deal with when we go outside of these walls. The mindset is faith is something you just take by blind faith. You don't have any reasons for it. And science and studies and evidence in this real world are over here when really the truth of the matter is we need to have reasons for what we believe. And so Jesus appears to his disciples he tells Thomas at one point, he says, Thomas, Thomas wasn't there when the first time he appeared. He says, put your hand in, in my wrist, which really, by the way, crucified, it'd be right here. Put your hand in my hand, which is part of the hand in the Roman world. Put your hand in my side. Thomas, it's me. I was dead. Now I'm alive. And that's so he appears to them for 40 days. 
So he doesn't just appear one time. He comes back over and over and over, and he addresses the disciples for 10 days, on the, on the four, or for 40 days. On the 40th day, the Bible tells us, and this is kind of where we're going to pick up this week, is that Jesus will ascend to heaven. We're going to pick it up in a few, a few scriptures there and, and get into some things tonight. So I, but I want to connect this to something we're familiar with. So the first eight verses of Acts are kind of like clue. Jesus on Golgotha. The cross. On the cross. In an empty tomb. <coughs> He's alive. We are not being asked to just blindly believe in the gospel. There is evidence. And I've spent my whole life, I've been studying the scriptures diligently since I was about 18 years of age. I've studied all kinds of subjects to, to believe, to make sure that what I believe is real and based in reality. So I've read books by atheists. I've read books by scientists. I've studied evolution. I've studied creation. I've studied a lot of different subjects over the course of my life to, see, to answer one question. Can I trust this book? <coughs> Can I trust the evidence that's presented here? Is my faith based in reason? I have reasons for what I believe. If you come to my office, because I love it. I've had atheists come to my office and debate me, and I love it. And they're usually surprised when I, I welcome them in. I don't mind their questions. I don't mind their doubt. In fact, I'm begging them to tell me something somebody else hasn't said. Give me another doubt so that I can, can, can explore it. That usually comes down to the same arguments. But we have a discussion and we look at the evidence. And what I have found, personally, is I have more reasons to believe than to not believe. That there's more evidence. When I look at the world, you know, for instance, if I get into science, I won't stay here too long, but if I, if I get into science, what do we see when we look at the geological record of the fossils? We see billions of dead things laid down by water and rock layers all over the earth. But what do those, what do those things tell us? They tell us something the scientists called stasis. That a dog's a dog, a cat's a cat. You know, a poodle is kind of like a subpar dog. <laughs> you know, cat is like God. But, but they're really, then you have the Cambrian explosion where all this life just kind of explodes and you, you, read, you hear all this stuff and what we see is what we see in the real world is that a dog's a dog, a cat's a cat, but yet they tell us to believe that a dinosaur became a bird. That is a theory, that is not evidence. That is an explanation, but it's not evidence. What evidence we have is a dog, a dog, a cat's a cat, which... When I look in the Bible, the Bible says when God created everything, He created everything according to its kind. In other words, the dog family was a kind, the cat family was a kind, and there's all kinds of dogs, but what the Bible tells me about the real world is dogs are dogs and cats are cats. When I go to the fossil record and what I see, I see a dog is a dog, a cat's a cat. Now you can explain that away, but you have to give me reasons why I should doubt what I see and what I read. We don't think like that when it comes to the Bible. But as I said last week, if a person lies to me over and over again, I begin to not believe them. What about you? And so if the Bible lies to me about dogs and cats and, and water and geology and archaeology, if it lies to me about that, I bet you it's lying to me about heaven and hell. And about the gospel. The good news is, over 30 years of study... I've yet to read anything that when you look at what they're saying really contradicts or denies what it's saying. If you have something, send it to me. I'd like to read it. Because if this isn't true, I want to know it. This book has cost me a lot. And just like other people, there's times I don't want to pay that price. But because I know it's true, I want to pay the price. Because the evidence is there. So God's not afraid of us challenging, using our brains, thinking things through. He's not afraid to, to, of doubt. He's not offended by it. In fact, He made you smart so that you could think about things and research things and not just go along with the flow and say, this is what everybody in the church believes, I'll believe. No, use your brain. And that's what He starts out in the book of Acts. Feel my side. See my hands. I was dead. You saw me dead. I'm alive. Okay? And now we've got a record of people that actually saw it. Now we come into verse 9. That's the first eight verses of Acts. 
Now, I was supposed to get through all that, this outline last week, but I only got through the first section because you're going to find, as we come to digging deeper, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to go through Acts, but really Acts is an opportunity for me to teach you a lot of other things. As we get to certain things, we're just going to park there and we're going to, we're going to cover some things and we're going to learn some things to keep it fresh. And, then, and by the time we get through Acts, we're going to go through basically every major subject that needs to be explored if you're going to study the Bible anyway. We're just going to do it over a journey. We're not going to make it a destination. And so we're going to do that a little bit tonight as we, as we continue in the book of Acts. So let's pick it up in chapter 1, verse 9. Acts was written by the, the physician Luke, who was a companion of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was the greatest missionary the church has ever seen. He, his mission trips were about 50 A.D., and he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. We'll read his story in Acts chapter 9. And so this writer actually accompanied a lot of the things and saw the things firsthand of what happened. The things that he reports early, however, he was not there. He's taking reports from other people that he knew were trustworthy. In verse 9 it says, Now when he had spoken these things, speaking of Jesus, Jesus had just told his disciples, they were talking about, you know, are you going to, are you going to end the world now and set Israel up as a, the kingdom of the world? And, and they call that eschatology. You do all this eschatological stuff. And Jesus said, boys, don't worry about that. Just go tell people about what I've done. I died on the cross for you. I rose from the dead. I sent the whole, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit soon to change your life and empower you and to give you help to get through life. That's what Jesus is going to, going to do in chapter 2. He says, so when he had ended speaking those things, while they watched... While they watched. In other words, they saw all this. It wasn't some kind of spiritual thing. It was watched in the natural realm, the natural world. He was taken up or ascended into heaven and a cloud received him out of their sight. So they're all gathering. We'll find out in verse 12. They're on the Mount of Olives or Mount Olivet, which is east of the city of Jerusalem. Modern day Jerusalem. You can still visit this Mount Olivet. There was a valley that ran between the city and this Mount of Olives. It was about, about a half a mile from the city. And so Jesus is in a grove, in a, in a, a, a grove, grove's right word, grove, an olive grove, and he ascends to heaven. They see it with their own eyes. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, in other words, they're standing there going, <laughs> they might have looked a lot like Gomer Pyle and Andy Griffin. Well, golly. You know, they're looking, wouldn't you? If I'm standing here at Eagle's Nest and I just start floating up to the sky, in fact, we ought to play a trick on you some night. I'll come up here and get some wires and I'll just start floating up to the sky. It would freak you out, wouldn't it? I'd be going. It would freak you out when you hit your head in the ceiling. It would freak me out. I didn't know when I hit my head on the ceiling. They're looking at as he went up. And behold, two men, now these are angels, stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up in heaven? Don't you love... If you ever read the Bible and take note of the questions, there's some really good questions in the Bible. Like when Adam and Eve have just eaten the apple or whatever the fruit was, and God says, Adam, where are you? Was he asking because he didn't know where he was? Or was he asking because he wanted them to know where they were? So he's saying, why do you gaze up to heaven staring? He's not saying, I, God's saying, man, I don't know what they're doing. He's trying to get their attention. He's, it's a rhetorical question. He's saying, guys, hey, what are you doing? This same Jesus, or actually the Greek, if you notice, some of your Bibles will have it in italics, the word same. That means it's not in the original language. It's added there for clarity or confusion, my professor used to say. Hmm. That's a translator. In this case, it kind of clarifies it. This Jesus, very important. This Jesus who appeared to you for 40 days. This Jesus who you put your hands in His side. This Jesus that was crucified. This Jesus that was born of the Virgin Mary. This Jesus that was a Jewish rabbi. This Jesus who you just saw ascend into heaven, rise into heaven with your own two eyes, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner. As you saw him go into heaven. Now, I looked up the Greek. I didn't bother to write the Greek down in my notes to impress you with it on the board because you wouldn't understand it anyway. But I looked it up to make sure to see how strong this sentence is. This sentence is a very strong sentence in the Greek. He's saying this Jesus who left like this. 
is going to come down like this. Now that's very important. Because as we get into this, what i got up here in just a minute, you're going to read, if you decide to study the Bible, and, and you're going to read certain things about the return of Jesus Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're going to read, there's all kinds of ideas out there and books out there that will just mess with your head. And all these things have been written. What I'm going to try to do for you tonight is to simplify it and show you how you can make sense of all that you would read. Okay? The first thing we've got to remember is he left in a certain manner. How did he leave? He was physical. He was visible. He went up to heaven. He's going to come down the same way. Okay? Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, the Sabbath day journey, which is about 3,000 feet or so, half a mile roughly. And so Jesus, so we're on number two of our, of our outline. Jesus ascends into heaven on the 40th day. And we'll read a little bit later that when he gets to heaven, he's going to sit on the right hand of God, which is where he really is sitting, he's sitting right now. And then he's ruling and reigning over the earth. So i got some really good news for you. The Chinese aren't in control, or in charge is a better word. Okay, the Russians aren't in charge. The Americans aren't in charge. Jesus Christ is in charge of this planet. That gives me great comfort when I watch the news. I don't watch it as much as I used to because it just disgusts me, but I get nervous when I look at what's going on in the world. So I have to shut the news off and I have to remember Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God and there's nothing that's going to happen in the earth that He won't allow. It doesn't mean He wants everything to happen, but I take great comfort in that. Personally, I hope you do too. And we'll read more about that later. But so we start with these three things that I've got listed here for you. Jesus ascends. <laughs> Disciples saw, saw Jesus ascend with their physical eyes. Jesus will come again the same way he left. And now I want to talk to you a little bit about the eschatology of the book of Acts. The word eschatology means the study of end things or last things. Esca is the Greek for last. And tology is the study of. And so... Eschatology is just a big theological word that helps people like me stay employed, okay? <laughs> professors to get jobs, okay? But it just means a study of end times or the last things before the world's wrapped up. It's got a, a lot, and a lot of people love this subject. I'm one of those, <coughs> and so I've spent a lot of time in my life studying this subject. But I want to simplify it for you because the book of Acts gives us a basic outline for what we would call the study of end times. I mean, if you watch the movies, I mean, how many saw the movie that came out about three or four years ago, Left Behind, or read the books? Those stories, those are all about eschatology and the end times. And they have a certain slant that they take on this, okay? And people disagree with the slant they have, because we don't know. The truth of the matter is, it's like, it's like being able to see something, like, it'd be like that whiteboard being halfway across the parking lot and I'm trying to read it through the window and I can make out some of the letters but I can't quite see it all. That's what really this end time stuff is like. And so when I read books or when you read books about people that say they've got it all, all sewn up and they have it figured out, you might want to back up because we don't see it that clearly. We see it from a distance. But there are some predictable patterns that we see in the New Testament and in the book of Acts that kind of help us organize our thoughts on the subject. And I want to give those to you before we move on. Jesus Christ, first of all, Jesus Christ is going to come back someday physically. Just like I said, we just read that in verses 9 to 11. Now, we start with Jesus came the first time. I don't know if everybody can see this back there, but it's in your notes there. I put a little, a little thing in your notes. It's not in mine, but I, I put something in your notes for you. The first coming of Jesus is what we saw at the beginning of Acts and the end of Luke, where Jesus came, he was born of a virgin, he was a Jewish man, he was a Jewish rabbi, he ministered to a Jewish community, he went around as an itinerant preacher, rabbi, preached the gospel, the kingdom of God. He was crucified because he threatened the established church. The church actually killed him. I could preach there, but we'll move on. Sometimes the most dangerous place for a preacher is in the church. Okay? And Jesus was crucified because he went up against the religious establishment. And he threatened the political establishment in preaching the gospel. And the reason why he did that was he was extending 
the boundaries and creating an opportunity for people who had been rejected and kept out of the church. He's saying everybody's welcome. Jesus is inclusive. He includes anybody who wants to come to Him. However, Jesus is also, He's not, what's the best way to say this? Jesus doesn't say you can do whatever you want, but He says everybody's welcome. So there's inclusiveness, but there's still standards. I have to balance that today because people go all over the place when I use the word inclusive. But Jesus ministers. He, he's crucified. He rises from the dead. He commissions the disciples. That's His first coming. We read in Acts 1, 1 through 8. He ascends into heaven, Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. And so I've got listed here in blue the birth, the ministry, the cross, the resurrection, the ascension. And by the way, as we'll see next week, the ascension is often overlooked. But it's a very important thing that Jesus did in this lifetime. His lifetime, His first coming. Very important. So you kind of draw a line there. Okay, Jesus ascends to heaven. Now we, we, we fast forward to the book of Acts, if you've got your Bible with you. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, because it tells us what's happening right now in our world eschatologically or end times wise. What is happening right now in our world when it comes to Jesus? Where is Jesus? And what is happening right now? We read it in verse 19 where it says, Repent therefore... And we'll get to this in a few weeks. And be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he might send Jesus, Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And he's talking about in the Old Testament. So we now find out that Jesus, and I think I have this in your notes, right now Jesus is retained in heaven. He's in heaven right now, seated at the right hand of God. All authority and power on the earth has been given to him by God, according to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. Okay? But Peter says, heaven must retain him till when? What's it say? To the restoration of all things. Does anybody remember last week the question that the disciples were asking Jesus in Acts 1, 6 through 8? Now you're going to look there now, I know. His disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, will you now restore unto Israel the kingdom? Now we're saying, Jesus says, hey guys, it's not for you to know the times and seasons of the restoration, which is over here. We haven't gotten to it yet. He says, right now I want you to be witnesses of me everywhere you go. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's like basically like saying, if Jesus was here in Milton, be witnesses to me in Milton, in Sussex County, Kent County, and D.C. Go out into the earth and, and be a witness of me, my first coming. That's what we saw last week. Now we're finding that Jesus wants us to continue to do that until the time of the restoration of all things. He gives us a demarcation of when this period of time, I call this a gap. You know what a gap is, right? If you watch football, what's his name? The guy that has a gap in his teeth? The gap. What's his name? This Mike, Strahan. Michael Strahan. Mike Strahan. He gets teased about it all the time. Gap. There's a space. Now, Jesus during this time is advancing the kingdom. This is called the Messianic Age. The age of the Messiah. It's also called in your Bible, you may want to write this down if you're a studier. It's also called the time of the Gentiles in the Bible. It's in the book of Luke. i got some other things I wrote down here, but I can't remember what they are. Um, some people might even call this, and I would in my eschatological view, I call this the millennium. Have you ever heard the term the millennium? And I don't mean the millennium falcon, falcon from Star Wars. The millennium is a thousand year period that's talked about in the book of Revelation chapter 20. It's a long period of time and scholars debate on when this thousand year period is, whether it's literal, and where it fits in the grand scheme of things. Okay, So I just gave you an opinion. Okay, But I'm just throwing that out for those that, are, that want to go a little bit deeper there. Doesn't mean you have to agree with me. Doesn't mean I'm right. It's just, I'm trying to reconcile things. But this much is for certain. Acts talks about Jesus' first coming. His death, His resurrection. 
It talks about a, a gap, an error where heaven retains Jesus until the restoration of all things, which is His second coming. He says, because then God will send Jesus from heaven. Now what you're going to find is, you're going to find all through the New Testament, these three things are touched upon throughout the New Testament. Okay? And so the best way to kind of keep sense of it all, because you're going to read Scripture and say, where does this one fit? Where does this one fit? If you just kind of find which container to put it in, it'll begin to make a lot more sense to you. Because if you read, like I've read a ton of stuff, they, they, they talk about the new heavens and the new earth. They talk about the new Jerusalem. They talk about the age to come, the world to come. I just confused half of you. Okay, uh, Where do you fit all that stuff? Because when you read the literature about what was being taught back then, they were just as confused about this stuff in Jesus' day as we are. And they had all this terminology that they used that we kind of read it once here, here, there. We don't quite understand the background of all this stuff, but the writers of Scripture were using these terms too in a certain way. And so the easiest way to understand it is just three things. I'm a simple guy. I cannot solve a problem... Uh, what they call it, the whole, you ever get a ball of string? You know, the only way I can take a ball of string and, and, and unravel is find the end. I can't unravel it all together. So if somebody gives me a problem, you know, people come in to pass, you know, the past Pastor Bob, I got, I got, they're like a machine that, all these problems. I have to say, I'm very ADD. Give me one problem at a time. Okay? I have to simplify it. To, to, to figure out where do you start pulling the thread. Okay? Eschatology is a lot like that. The study of end times is very complicated. It's a deep subject. So what I'm constantly trying to do and trying to help you with is to simplify it by saying, just remember three things. I can remember three things. You can probably remember more, but I can only remember three. Jesus is first coming. It's already taking place. Since about 30 or 33 A.D., there's this gap period that heaven is retaining Jesus, which we call now, right? So you could call this now. And there's a future day when Jesus Christ is going to return like He left, and He's going to restore all things. Four things will happen when Jesus returns. At least four things. One, He will return. He will return physically, and He will return visibly. Two, there will be a resurrection of all the dead. The dead will rise from the grave. Number three, there will be a restoration of all things. The whole planet is going to get a makeover. Move that! Yes. That's right. That's what's going to happen. Now you'll see all these in the New Testament. And finally, there's going to be retribution. It's an R word. It means judgment. There will be a judgment. This is something that's not so popular today. People want to talk about God's grace and God's mercy, and He certainly is merciful and just, and, and God, and he's, he's generous and long-suffering. But there's a test at the end of this thing. You remember being in school? Some of you, it's been a long time. You had exams at the end of the year. That's what I kind of like in the judgment of God. Now, here's the good news. The good news of the gospel is the way to get ready for this is just put your faith in Jesus and do what He says. <laughs> You know, trust in Him, follow Him, um, but it doesn't mean you can live any way you want. It's another myth in the, in the modern church. Jesus called us to follow Him, not just believe in Him. So, it doesn't mean you have to be perfect, because you're not going to get to heaven because you're perfect. Because nobody's going to get to heaven. He was perfect. But we put our faith in Him, and he, take, he took our judgment for us on the cross. So we don't have to be judged, but there are people that refuse to accept what Christ has done. And there will be a judgment at the end. And if we lose this, if we, if we, if we let go of this truth, we're not being true to the whole Scripture. And, um, and what's interesting, though, is that God does not delight in this at all. He would rather not have to judge. Why do you think He's so patient? Peter says in his writings, and Peter says the reason God is waiting to come back a second time is because He's patient and long-suffering. He doesn't want anybody to have to, be, to experience His judgment. So he's giving us opportunity and opportunity. Kind of like parents, you know, when my kids were younger, like 19, <laughs> and they would do something wrong, I didn't want to punish them. I didn't go, oh, 
I get to spank them. Glory to God. I didn't want to spank them. I didn't want to punish them. In fact, I wanted to buy them stuff. And many times I, I tell my kids, I want to buy you this. And at the end, and when we go to the mall this week, and during the week, that became leverage. <laughs> and they would violate it, and, I, and I'd have to punish them. And one of the ways I have to punish them, well, you can't have that right now. He sprayed my heart. And I just want to go out, and I would look for any kind of way that I could get out from having to not do that. I would give them opportunity and opportunity to, to if, you just, if you just do this, you know, in response to what I'm saying, then I'll, I'll still buy this thing. And, I, and you, I can see you smile because you've probably done the same thing. I didn't want to judge him. God doesn't want to judge his people either. He, he sent Jesus so that, that we don't have to be judged. But you know, just like a parent, after a while, sometimes you're just going to have you're going to have to get you're going to have to be in time out. You're going to have to not be able to go to that event because you're trying to correct. And so, this is the heart of God. But as we look at theology, I just want to simplify. Just think of three buckets: Jesus' first coming, what's happening right now. He's in heaven, ruling and reigning. He's working out a plan in the earth. The kingdom of God is advancing. This is called the kingdom of God that you'll read about in the scripture. His kingdom is growing. More and more. You know, right now, there are more Muslims receiving Jesus Christ than ever in the history of the world. We look at the news, we look at America, and we tend to get discouraged about church. There was an article in Fox, Ma in fact, Fo not Fox Magazine, Fo Fox News had a guy on, a pastor said, church is over. Church in America is done with. What Bible he's been reading? None. The kingdom of God, the church of Jesus Christ is expanding throughout the world. What The way we do church is changing. You know, what we call church is changing, and that's a good thing. But the kingdom of Jesus is expanding. I've seen it firsthand. I've seen miracles lately firsthand. That's the most incredible thing I've seen in a while was the videotape my friend Harold Everly showed me of a, of a million, over a million people in Pakistan were in this big giant, what you call, we would call like a Billy Graham crusade, they call it a festival then. There are a million people in this, just for like five miles, just people. This guy comes up to the stage to shoot the evangelist who's preaching the gospel. He's got a gun. He aims it at the preacher the Holy Spirit comes on this guy, knocks him out, and it's on, he caught this on video. I mean, this is all on video. I've seen the video. The Holy Spirit knocks him out, but it's like, it's like you ever see a wheat field that the wind blows on it and the wheat's going down? Yeah. For half a mile, everyone, everybody that was there in front of the stage got knocked over by like a wind. It looks just like a, like a, a wheat field that wind's blowing over. That guy stayed unconscious so he finished preaching. After he finished preaching, he woke up and got saved, accepted Jesus Christ. Amen. What happened to the gun? I don't know what happened to the gun. But, but at, those, at those festivals, we call them festivals because you don't talk about crusades in a Muslim country. That, right outside that festival, the Taliban was waiting to get people. But the majority of them receive Christ. It's happening through the world. I've met people that have had dreams. I met one guy that we've done some work with that uh, he was in Hezbollah. He guarded the Iranian president. And he had a vision of Jesus in a dream. And Jesus led him out of the country. He had two visions of Jesus. Now he's an evangelist sharing the gospel throughout the world. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening throughout. The, I don't want to say his name. Uh, what the fellow we had here? I don't. I don't. I don't want to give too much information because this might be on TV. Um, what I'm saying is, don't get discouraged about everything you see in the in the country. The gospel is going doing very well. The church is growing. In America, we are changing because of cultural things. But the truth of the matter is the gospel is going forward. We have every reason to be encouraged because the kingdom of God is advancing. And at some point, Jesus will return. I don't know when. Of course, I could write a book and tell you when he's coming back. Probably make a lot of money. I'd lose my job. But, so I have to sell a lot of books. Now, we don't know. But that's what we call eschatology. Jesus is coming back. There's a lot of things that, that we're going to touch on. Um, as we go through Acts, it will we'll add to this.
Any questions about Jesus, the return of Christ, anything that you want to ask while we're at a transition point? Either I'm doing really great or really poor. But any questions? Any questions about disciplining my kids? <laughs> Can we naturally say that, that when Jesus comes back, comes back, He's going to come back to the same place. He's going to, his feet will touch the Mount of Olives according to the book of Zechariah. It will split in two. And it's going to be a pretty, now, we don't know, and we'll get into this maybe next week when it, some of the language of the Bible is symbolic. We don't, we've got to be careful how literal some of the things it says we take. And this is where we get into opinion and, and, and we have to understand the background. But it does say he will step on the Mount of Olives. He left Mount of Olivet. So he's going to come back to Mount Olivet, and that is very talk, that is talked about in the Old Testament. But is that what, are we all going to? If those that are here, is see everybody going to be able to see that? Or I would assume so. Of course, I don't know how it's going to work. I mean, I mean, think about this. Just physically, I did think about this today because I said, you know, someone's going to ask me that question." <laughs> is back when this scripture was written, and other scriptures that talk about every eye seeing him. You literally couldn't have everybody see him unless it was a miracle, right? right. But with television satellite, mm -hmm. every eye literally could see him. Everybody will be there with a the cell phone doing this. That's right. Do a selfie. Jesus in the background coming down, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it's going to work. I, I, some things I know less of now than I did when I started studying this stuff. I, I don't know. And I read books and I'm like, they don't know either. They have good opinions. Some of the opinions might be good. So what Jesus go, So we go back, and at the end of this message, I'll get back to the kingdom principles that we want to remember. And one of the first one is, don't obsess about all this stuff. It's focused that we can know very clearly who Jesus is, why He came, when He was born, what He did, the fact that He rose from the dead. There is evidence, as we'll see when Paul goes to Athens, you talk about a pagan place. You talk about a religious place. You talk about a philosophical place. He went to Athens, the heart of the culture, and preached Jesus and actually led people to Jesus. And he talks about evidence. He gives them evidence. And the evidence is the resurrection. That Jesus gave us evidence of what he's saying is true by the fact that he rose from the dead. We'll look at that later because I don't want to... Because you're only going to remember 5% of this. What 5% do you remember? First coming... Now, he's coming back. And I gave you some labels there. However you want to remember it. I try to put R's and T's and P's because my brain just can't remember all this stuff. And so I try to make it easy for myself as well as you. And so that's Acts chapter 1. We'll get back to Acts chapter 1 verses. So we have first eight verses. Jesus is playing clue, so to speak. He uh, tells them about... Uh, 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 about who he is, and he confirms it with evidence. And then we see we talk about Jesus' uh, ascension to heaven. He's been coming down and showing himself, but he ascended to heaven for one final time, and he's seated at the right hand of God, waiting for the time when the Father says, "Go back to earth and wrap this thing up." Now, when he wraps this thing up, he's going to restore the he restore everything. That's when John talks about the new heavens and new earth in the book of Revelation. So those are some things that you'll learn as you read other parts of Scripture. Okay. Now we get into verse 12 through the rest of the chapter. I'm probably not going to go into as much detail here because you can read this and basically get the, the, the basic understanding of what's happening here in the rest of this chapter. But we're going to kind of go through it uh, to give you an overview. Uh, and we should be able to get through this so I can get back on course uh, when it comes to uh, the schedule that I have to preach this stuff. Verse 12, they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These are the eleven apostles of Christ except for Judas. Judas is the one that betrayed Jesus. And we're about to find out a little bit more information about him. And they're going to replace Judas. So they, they come back from the Mount of Olives after Jesus ascends. It says in verse 14, They all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Brothers means brothers. Jesus had brothers. Okay. Mary was a virgin until Jesus was born. And then because the state of marriage is holy, 
She had other kids. I'll just leave it there. That's who she's talking about. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. Now think about this. Jesus has been doing miracles like no one else has ever done miracles. Even Jesus' enemies, when you read ancient writing about the time of Jesus, you'll find that even Jesus' enemies will tell you that the tomb was empty. Even Jesus' enemies will tell you that he did miracles. They just described him to the devil. But after all the miracles he did, after all the sermons he preached, he's only got a church of 120. Hmm. And I heard, you know, my first church, I heard, you know, kind of grew up there, and, and the people would say, we just need more miracles and more people will believe. I don't work for Jesus. You know, we tend to think that certain things are the, are the, the answer. You know, like church, uh, this is the circles I flow in. We, we're always trying to grow our churches. No pastor wants people to leave their church. No pastor wants a small church. Everybody wants more people. That's our problem. That's what we deal with. And we, we, we're looking for the silver bullet. And the truth of the matter is, there is no silver bullet other than follow God and do what He tells you. But Jesus, after all this time, only has 120. And He's fed thousands. At one place, He probably fed 20,000 people. Loaves and fishes off a, <coughs> off a few a little boy's lunch. They wanted to come and make him king, it says in John 6. He's got 120 people that are rallying around him that really believe. Boy, there's a message deeper in there. So they gathered together and now they're praying. Because at the 40-day mark, Jesus ascended. And in Acts 2, we're going to read about Pentecost, which is the 50th day after Jesus ascended. Or after Passover. It was 10 days later. And they're, pray they're going to pray for 10 days. But while they're gathering together, they not only pray... They replaced Judas. It says, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David concerning Judas. Now, David is King David, who was a prophet in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is the one who anointed the prophets of old and gave them their messages. And, and he's saying that the Old Testament actually predicted that Judas would betray Jesus. Which our Old Testament, remember, we talked about the Old Testament and the New Testament. Two parts of our Bible. The Old Testament is the, is the old section. This is, was written 400 years or more before Jesus' Jesus's time. So they foretold this. If I foretold, if I foretold something, let's say today I prophesy, and I say, Eagle's Nest will have a Chick-fil-A in every church that they plant. And yet that doesn't happen, but 100 years it happens, you'd probably take my other writings and sermons and listen to them, wouldn't you? <laughs> How do you know that, right? 400 years or more earlier, the, the prophets predicted various things that were going to happen, and they happened. That's why it's one of the evidences we have for the Old Testament. Some of the prophecies in the Old Testament are so clear, so precise, that it's virtually impossible. One guy, and I, and I can't remember some of the exact details of this, so, but, but one guy said it's like, when talking about one of the Old Testament prophecies like Isaiah 53 or, or Daniel chapter 9, which is, gives you the timeline, tells exactly when Jesus is going to be killed. The chances of that prophecy coming to pass would be like filling Texas with silver dollars a foot deep, getting in a plane and dropping your silver dollar, red silver dollar, in the midst of it, and being able to find that in the dark blindfolded. <laughs> I call that impossible. These prophecies are evidence. We're talking about evidence again. But I didn't have time to gather all that stuff and you won't remember it all. But, but well, you'll remember a lot more. I'm not giving you enough credit. You'll remember a lot of it. Some of you do better when you're sleeping anyway. So as you're sleeping tonight, you'll get a lot from me, right? That's a joke. <laughs> For he was to, so he goes on to say that in the Old Testament, he was the guide to those who rested Jesus, that's Judas. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. He's one of the twelve apostles. So Jesus had twelve people that followed him and he, they made him his rabbi and one betrayed him. And so even Jesus in picking a team had somebody that didn't make it. For, pra for pastors, that's an encouraging word. We're not perfect. Jesus didn't do it perfect even though he knew who he was getting his team had a bad team member. You ever been on a team with a bad team member? Even Jesus did. Okay? 
Now this man purchased a field with the wages of his iniquity. Remember, if you remember the story, some of you may remember, some may have heard it, but Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And it says, Now this man purchased a field with the wages of his iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle of the property, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called, in their own language, Akeldama, that is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Old Testament part of the Bible, let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Now, one of the things you'll find is any time that a speaker in the, in the book of Acts is speaking to a Jewish audience, they're always going to appeal to Scripture, Old Testament Scripture. Do you know why? Because that's what their authority in life was. When we'll see next week, if we get to it, we'll see that whenever they're talking to non-Jewish people, they use other things. And there's really a lesson there. When you're speaking to your audience, you've got to speak to what they see as authoritative to create a bridge for them to understand. So when Paul's in Athens, Paul's going to quote their philosophers. He's going to meet them where they are. But when, he speak, when you're speaking to Jewish people, he quotes Scripture because everybody knew Scripture. Man, they love Scripture. They were kind of like today where, uh, you know, in some of our Bible classes, we teach kids to memorize the Bible and those kind of things. That's what they did with their kids all the time. And so they knew the Scriptures and they valued the Scriptures. And so he's telling them that the Old Testament, whatever you read in the Bible, it's already told you this was going to happen. And Judas bought this field. Now, he didn't really buy this field. What Matthew tells us in the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 1 through 12 or 13. It tells us, he, Matthew's the only one who tells us the story of Judas as well as Acts here. What happened was Judas betrays Jesus. Then his, his heart is filled with remorse. He regretted it. And so he goes back to the chief priests and he says, Jesus is an innocent man and I betrayed an innocent man. It's not right to put him to death because he's innocent. The chief priests scoffed at him. And then Judas got so upset that he threw the 30 pieces of silver back to the chief priest. The chief priest pick up the pick up the bag of money or the, the money that's going everywhere and they say to each other, you know, it's really not lawful to put this money in the offering plate. Now when he says lawful, he's talking about their religious law, not the Bible law. He says it's really not a good thing to do. We shouldn't do that. So let's buy this field as a cemetery for those that are not church members. Okay, basically. And they buy this field. That's what Acts is referring to. So we have two witnesses to this story. Don't think of it as one witness. We have two witnesses. We have Matthew, who's Jewish, who is an eyewitness of the accounts. And we have Luke, who has been studying it as a historian and is getting evidence and gathering stories that have been confirmed. And so we have two witnesses to what happened to Judas. Judas betrays Jesus and he has something called remorse. Now the Greek word for remorse is different than the Greek word for repentance. The Bible tells us to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance means to say, Lord, I'm wrong, but not only wrong, I'm sorry that I'm wrong. And if I could not do it again, I wouldn't do it again, and I'm willing to make a change. Whereas remorse says, I'm sorry I got caught. You know, you know the difference if you're raising kids. You know, your kids get caught. I like to use kids because they're not here and they can't defend themselves. I can say whatever I want. <laughs> But you know, when kids get caught, there was a time when my kids got caught, they were authentically repentant. They would say, I'm sorry, Daddy, I did wrong, and I, and I, and I want to I fix it if I could, but I know it's broken, it's going to cost you a lot of money. But there's other times they just said they're sorry because they didn't want to get in trouble. That's Judas. I remember one time, I'll tell you this little story, it'll be on all over the internet, it's going to be get 10 million hits, go viral. I remember one time, Kyle, my mom, Patty and I were walking, and we were living in Starlight Meadows down just about a mile here from the church, and the kids were young. I can't remember how old, but Kyle was in a bad mood. So we took him out for a walk. He was on a scooter. And so we're walking down the street, and no matter what we did, we couldn't keep him reined in. He was, he was just antsy and irritable. And so we, we turned the corner into our driveway, and Kyle gets this attitude, and he starts doing his scooter really, really fast, and he, he gets right near the garage, right where the van is. And he jumps off that scooter and lets that scooter hit right into the back of the van, puts a big dent in it. Boy, I was ticked. Man, he did, that was it. 
I was ticked. Now, what do you do when your kids tick you off? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what you do, parents. You walk away. Mm -hmm. I told my wife, and I said, you know what? He needs to be punished. But I can't punish him right now. Because I'm mad. Mm -hmm. And I made it a policy to never discipline my kids while I was mad. Okay? I'm speaking to some parents now. All right? I don't know what that has to do with anything I'm saying. <laughs> but that's some good parent parental advice. Okay? Where was I? Uh, oh, remorse. He was not repentant. But I promise you he was remorseful. He was sorry because he knew the consequences were going to be high. He put a big debt. That debt was into the back of that car until the day Caleb totaled it. <laughs> That's a whole other story. Yeah. <laughs> and you walked away. And I walked, walked away. away. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Judas was remorseful. And so there's a difference between being sorry for the consequences of our decisions and really saying, I did wrong. It's wrong. <clears throat> God, all God's looking for from us, it's amazing. All God's really looking for us is to submit it. We did wrong. You know, you catch the kids in the cookie jar and they got chocolate all over their mouths and chocolate on the head. You take cookies, not me. <laughs> there is something so important for all of us. And this is the gospel. God's willing to forgive us for anything that we've ever done. But there's something about just saying, I screwed up. He doesn't need to hear it. We need to say it. We need to acknowledge it. And he says, if you'll do it, I'll forgive you for anything. And I'll help you. Even if you're caught up in something that you can't get out of. I will help you transform your life. But you've got to come clean. You've got to come clean that you did it wrong. And you did it on purpose. And so Judas didn't do that. And so Judas' end was not very good. It says he bought, they bought this field. And from what we can gather, the story is that Judas went out and hung himself. And it's not a good idea. And let me speak to that right now. Suicide's on the rise. It's epidemic. Suicide is the ultimate escape. It's concerning me greatly as a pastor. It's epidemic. And all it is is an escape. Suicide's never the answer. You struggle with suicide, come see me. It's not, what, it's not the way out. Judas hung himself in remorse. What he really needed to do was admit he screwed up and get help. And I believe Jesus would have forgiven him if he had asked. If he just taken it on and said, I, I messed up. Jesus, I betrayed you. Peter denied. Peter, his number one apostle, his number one friend, denied him three times. And Jesus forgave him for that. Judas didn't really do much worse than that, other than he never came back to Jesus and asked for forgiveness. And so now they're about ready because Jesus has risen from the dead. They only have 11 apostles. And they say, we've got to have a 12-man team. In a football team, you have 11 players. Right? What happens if you go out... On, on, the, on the field with only 10. You ain't going to get anywhere because the other team has 11. Jesus has 12 apostles, so they say they gather together, they're praying, and then Peter stands up and says, you know, we really need to replace Judas. So we pick that up after they tell Judas' the story. Verse 21, it says, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us, they're talking about the 120. Out of the 120, there's a group of men. And Peter's saying, okay, out of, the 100, out of this church of 120, let's pick the next guy who's to, to be part of our ministry. He says, they have accompanied us, here's the qualification, of all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. In other words, they saw Jesus' ministry firsthand, beginning from the baptism of John, which the Gospels start with, a guy named John the Baptist who's preaching the Gospel, who is Jesus' cousin. When he was, and from John the Baptist, which is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, all the way to who's taken up from us, which is the ascension we just read about. One of these must become a witness with us of His resurrection. So the, the, they're, they're going to be a witness. They're going to testify to everybody, I saw Jesus, I saw His ministry, I saw Him die, and I saw Him ar arise from the dead. I saw Him after He was dead. And they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of us all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, in other words, he sinned, that he might go to his own place. Now let me just say this. A lot of, I've heard 
people pontificate on Judas went to his own place. You know, there's all kinds of weird stuff out there. Just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. You know, don't. You're not going to be able to answer the question. Okay, his own place as he stood before God, and God did what was appropriate, right, just, and merciful. And I'd leave it there. People get my mother used to get into this with me all the time. She just went to his place, went to his place, and we would get into these debates. And you know, how moms are um, always wrong, but don't want to admit it. Um, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. And they cast their lots. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now what lots were, i got to look it up because I forgot what it was. Um, basically, lot casting was an Old Testament method for determining uh, a decision. Um, they would mark stones, and they'd place them in a jar. So if there were two candidates to take the jar... Put, maybe put a, the, the, the first letter of his name on it or a mark that represented each one. They'd put it in the jar. They'd shake the jar up and they'd pick one out. Doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? That's how they chose the 12th apostle. Because that's what they did in the Old Testament. In fact, they were doing it in the temple. Every day when they went into the temple of Jerusalem, which was still active then, they would choose which priests would get to do various things in the temple by casting these lots. But here's the interesting thing. You never see him casting lots again. Because after the Holy Spirit is poured out next week, they won't need to cast lots because they can hear God. But right now they're doing what they know to do. So here's a principle. God will honor us when we're ignorant. When we don't know what to do, and we do what we know what to do, and our hearts are in tune with Him, and we really want to do what He wants, and we make a decision, and I've had this conversation 100, 200 times in my ministry career, but I've had it once. People come in, I'm afraid to make a decision, I'm afraid to get it wrong. And I'll say, do you really want to do what God wants you to do? And they'll say, yes, I do. Have you sought God and prayed about it? Yes, I have. Uh, do you have to make a decision today? Yes, I do. Has God told you what to do? No, He hasn't. No, I, ask my, I say, let me ask you a question. Back to the kids thing. If your child comes to you and says, Daddy, Mommy, what do you want me to do? If your kid comes to you and says, Mommy, Daddy, I don't know what to do, but I want to do what you want to do. Mommy, Daddy, I want to make you happy and please you. Let me ask you a question. Do you get mad at them when they do the wrong thing then? No. Why do you think God would? You're trying to do what He wants. You're asking Him what He wants. He doesn't tell you. You search the Scripture, you do all kinds of stuff to find out what He wants, and you do the best decision you can, and you make the wrong decision. God's happy with you. Now, it still may be a bad decision. You might have to fix it. He'll show you later. And the reason I bring this up, because I've met so many Christians over the course of my life that they get paralyzed in decision making. I mean, they go out for ice cream and they stand there five minutes. Lord, do you want me to get number one or number five? <laughs> Lord says, get both. <laughs> you know, and we get paralyzed in decision making, afraid to make a mistake, as if God is this mean ogre that if you get every, anything wrong, He's going to smack you. These guys are cast in lots. These guys have seen Jesus directly. These guys have seen miracles. These guys have been on a mountain when Jesus transfigured in front of them. They saw Him glorified. These guys trying to make a serious decision and they're putting two rocks in a bottle to put guy over to church. And God honors it. Because they did what they knew could do and they were at a place where they couldn't do anymore. And I'd say to you tonight, do what you know to do. Keep your heart open to what God wants to do in your life. And if you fail, go to Him. He's not mad at you. He's still going to help. And if He hasn't told you what to do, it might be because He's trying to help you figure some things out. I used to think, and I don't think anymore, that God wants to stand on our shoulder and tell us how to do everything. He wants to be part. He wants to partner with us. And so the lot fell on this guy, Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11. So what they did is we review, as we wrap this thing up, we do some review and we'll close it up. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, 
Luke introduces the, his, his, the book of Acts by giving testimony of Jesus, giving us evidence of his resurrection. Then we find in verses 9 through 11, Jesus ascends to heaven literally, physically, and the, and the angel says he's going to return the same way, and he's going to return on the Mount of Olives, just, or Olivet, just as he left there. Then we see in verses 12 through 26 that the apostles, who are Jesus' 12 followers, they wait for God to send the Holy Spirit. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? He's the third person of the Trinity. This Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make one God, three divine persons. I don't understand it. I just know it to be the case. Whenever I read in the Bible about God the Father, He's God. Whenever we read about God the Son, He's God. Whenever we read about God the Holy Spirit, He's God. How it works, I don't know. But it's like an egg. An egg is a shell. It's a yolk. And it's an egg white. It's all A. Water is ice, it's steam, and it's liquid. It's all water. God is one, but He's three. I don't understand it. I used to want to understand it. I gave up a long time ago because nobody understands it. It's just the fact of who He is. So when you're talking about the Holy Spirit, you're talking about God. You're talking about God when you're talking about Jesus. And so don't get too wrapped up in trying to understand it because it really is a mind bender. It's a lot like saying, picture nothing. <laughs> Or picture this one. Scientists say that space has an edge. What's on the other side? What's on the other side? It's space! The universe is expanding. Really? In my view, there's some things I can't... You know, I can't even fathom there being no God. There's some things that... you know. So the Trinity is one of those things. You're not going to be able to wrap your mind around it. But it's clear in the Bible that God is the Holy Spirit. God is the Father. They're not one. And, I mean, they're one, but they're not the same. Um, and I could get deeper than that in the Scripture, but we've covered enough. I don't want to overwhelm you any more than I have. Um, and so they're told to wait until the Holy Spirit comes, which we will talk about next week. And they're praying, and then they replace Judas. Which leads us to the final thing that we want to review, and then we'll get you out of here. Kingdom Watch. What I'm calling Kingdom Watch. As we go through the book of Acts, what I want to do is just kind of list out for us, as we do it, is list out every reference to the kingdom of heaven, or eschatology, whatever word you want to put on it, and so that it'll help you as we get through this book. You'll begin to get some guidelines for if you want to study any further. and say, look, how do I keep... How do I navigate all the things that I'm going to read? And so it will help you. And so we come on three things. One, the kingdom of God begins with Jesus' first coming. We should not be obsessed about figuring out all this stuff because you'll just drive yourself nuts. You'll become combative. People will disagree with you. And you'll disagree with them. And the truth of the matter is, I love to get together with people that are disagreeing all over the place because when we're looking at it from different perspectives, we learn from each other. And by the way, can I just share this with you? Do you know rabbis' primary method of teaching was debate? <laughs> the whole idea of a rabbi was to get you to debate what was being said. To get you to make an argument that I was wrong. How would that work today in America? <laughs> because they believed if they could get you questioning and thinking that it made you learn more. So when you come here, if I say things you don't agree, that you don't agree with, you're welcome to raise your hand and say, Pastor Bob, you're wrong, and here's why. I suggest you don't do it that way, but... Because <laughs> if I've had chocolate, I know it's going to be bad, but... No, but if you come say, like, I, don't, I, don't, I see it this way, or what about this? They would ask a lot of questions. You know, I'm just trying to learn like you. We, between us, we've all read more books than what I've ever read. You know, and I'm trying to learn so you can help me. Like, well, I haven't thought about that. Let's, get, let's study it. And so... Jesus, they often taught with debate, and so it's good to actually question and, and think things through. And so, um, as we look at the kingdom of God, we don't want to become obsessed with this stuff to, to a fault and, and, and get really dogmatic because there's a lot of room for, for disagreement. And finally, the physical return, the eschatological kingdom, the return of Jesus will happen physically and literally. And if you will drive those three things... And some of the other things, we have stakes in the ground. As we read through the New Testament, some of the confusing things will get a little, a little bit easier to understand because there are some things, I have to admit, even today, we'll see one next week, 
Scholars still don't know what it means. People much smarter than me, and they're still trying to figure it out. So it tells you, you know, there's things that we just don't know. So as we wrap this up, is there anything I need to clarify? You know, like some of my jokes. I don't mean it. I'm not mean spirit when I pick on my kids or whatever. I'm just joking. Okay. Uh, anything theologically? Any questions you have? Because they're not going to be out for another three or four minutes, and we'll get you out of here. Hopefully, this was helpful. Uh, next week, we'll we'll get into Acts two. Going once. Yes. Return of Jesus is you just look over and your neighbor is gone. Yeah. So is it more like you'll know that the return is happening because it's literally visible? That's a great question. Because what you just hit on is the resurrection. Some people divide the resurrection into something called a rapture, where people just disappear. But yet, gee, if you read the scriptures, the two events, the rapture and the resurrection, are a simultaneous event. And the scriptures say this, the resurrection happens first. And so I disagree, and many disagree with, but many agree with the movie, that that is an actual, actual portrayal of scriptures. Because what they do is those theologians separate the rapture when people disappear on the plane from the resurrection by seven years. It's called dispensationalism. Okay, It's a form of eschatology. Okay? <coughs> that looks at certain things a certain way. Okay? The problem that I have with many schools of theology is if I don't buy their book, I can't find it in Scripture. <laughs> and so if I say something to you that you can't read the Bible and say, you know what, if I were left to myself, come to that conclusion, you ought to doubt me. And that's what I have problems with that school of thought. So, is it totally wrong? No, but according to some... Like myself, we see that as inaccurate. But it's not hurting anybody. But it's not, if you look, if you study 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, okay, verses 12 through 18, Paul talks about the rapture, which is people being snatched away. But he says, those that are dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord will, will be raptured. So the resurrection now is a split second in the moment of twinkling of an eye according to 1 Corinthians 15. But if you're really going to read the scripture for what it says, it says the resurrection happens first. So you don't have to buy into that. I'm just saying what the scripture says. But that's why it's a little confusing. And truthfully, I'll go on record for saying this. It's kind of freaky to think that one day we're all going to be in planes everybody disappear. And, all, and a lot of that story is conjecture. It's fun to watch, it's fun to read, but it's not necessarily scripture. And it kind of t it's kind of like our modern version when I was younger, the 666 movies where they had people would walk around with 666 on their forehead like zombies. You know, that stuff's entertaining, but it's not necessarily scriptural. But it is a school of thought that many people believe, and they might be right. I just don't hold that view. And one of the reasons I tell you that is I want you to know my bias. There's nothing wrong with me you know, saying this is my bio. I want you to think for yourself. So that's what that is. It's called the rapture. Is that for anybody that's the first time you heard the rapture? Rapture is not when you get married. Everything's wonderful. <laughs> that's something else. Um, that's a great question, though. Did that help? Or was it too much? I mean, just rapture, resurrection, same event. The dead get, the dead get resurrected. Those which are alive get snatched up into heaven and can become invisible, go to heaven. But here's what Jesus comes back down to earth. So what's the time though between the return and then the rapture? Like you'll have known that he's returned and... You'll be with him. We'll be with him. First Corinthians says we'll be with him. We'll meet the Lord in the air. So what's going to happen in the language is really significant. This the word meet is used three times in the New Testament. It's always used as somebody meeting somebody like a king and escorting them into a city. So we, we that are alive, the dead will rise first. We will be raptured. We will meet Jesus in the air. And then He'll bring us to Jerusalem with Him. He'll go to the, we'll be going with Him to Mount of Olives if we follow the train of thought. So yes, we will know He's going to bring the dead with Him. And I'm really getting deep now. But, but what's going to happen is when we die, 
our spirits go to heaven, right? But we have no body. But our spirits and our body look the same. But we have no physical body. We can't touch the natural world. Our bodies are going to be resurrected. And we're going to be clothed on with a new body. I keep telling my wife, it gets better. <laughs> Glorified body. She says, oh, it's glorious enough. But that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> if I make it because of my pride. Yeah. But that, so, so your bodies, you're going to be clothed in an, in an eternal body. But when you, when you die, you go to heaven and you live with, you live with Jesus. They'll be re, but then will body and spirit will all come back to earth. Jesus is going to restore the earth and he's going to make it like the Garden of Eden. It's going to be paradise. So the rapture and the resurrection are basically one coin, two aspects at the same time. He's going to make it a paradise, but is that only going to go for a thousand years? According to the people that she's the movie? Yes. That's, that, that is a, there's different views on this, and if you have to go, go, but I'll explain this. It is called the millennium, that when Jesus returns, some people believe that there will be a thousand years where Jesus will reign on the earth as it is, okay, as the Messiah, the Christ, Okay? And at the end of the thousand years, he'll come again. But I tell people that would be his third coming. Okay, So I, that's called pre-millennialism. Jesus will come before the millennium. I'm getting really deep here. And then the thousand years will happen. I believe we're in the thousand years now. That's called amillennialism or post-millennialism. That what's happening in heaven, something's happening in heaven and something's happening on earth. Can't prove it. People have agreed with me. People disagree. We're getting really deep. So what I'm trying to get you to start with is the three things. Jesus is first coming. We have a gap. And then we have the future. If you can get that in your head, these questions that she's asking will be easier because she's asking about things that are future. And it's very astute. Great question. Okay. And the truth of the matter is we're all trying to figure it out. Okay? But over the time, you'll get familiar with the language and you will really learn. Start with the simple things. Does that kind of help? We can talk a little bit more afterwards, but I don't want to confuse people. The more I say, the more confusing it's going to get. It's like my Sunday sermon. <laughs> After the introduction, it gets money. Anybody else? If you would like to, less is more. Somebody said. Notice I preach longer Sunday? Less is more. All right, we'll see you next week. I'll be here to answer any questions if you'd like to uh, for a few minutes.